Welcome back, everyone. I hope you found our first plenary session insightful. Now I have the honor of introducing the speakers for our next plenary session titled Promoting Two-Spirit Health and Well-Being, a Conversation with Two-Spirit Youth Leaders. The moderator for this session is Dr. Jeffrey Anslus. Dr. Jeffrey Anslus is an assistant professor in Indigenous Health and Social Policy and the Canada Research Chair in Critical Studies in Indigenous Health and Social Action and Suicide at the University of Toronto. He is also the chair of the Indigenous Education Network at the Ontario Institutes for Studies in Education. He is a queer Cree psychologist of mixed Cree and English ancestry. His family comes from Fisher River Cree Nation. Jeffrey is joined today by two panelists, Mary Lang and Tonchen Redverse. Mary Lang is a queer Kanyan Kaka, scholar of mixed Haudenosaunee and Irish, Scottish, South African settler ancestry. Her family comes from six nations of the Grand River and she belongs to the Turtle Clan. Mary holds an Honours Bachelor's of Arts in Sexual Diversity Studies from the University of Toronto and a Master's of Arts in Social Justice Education from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. She currently works as a writer, researcher and educator in various capacities and she is a youth leader with the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. Welcome, Jeffrey. Welcome, Marie. And Tom Chai is a the name in two spirit social justice warrior, writer, creator, performer, and facilitator from Treaty 8 territory, Northwest Territories. She holds a BA in International Development Studies with specializations in gender and development on global citizenship, as well as a master's of indigenous social work from Wilfrid Perrier University. Recognized nationally and internationally for her work and advocacy, she is the co-founder of We Matter, a national organization dedicated to indigenous youth hope and life promotion. Her debut collection of poetry, Fireweed, was published in 2019 with Kegedown's Press with her writing aiming to decolonize and indigenize identity, mental health, and healing. She has spent considerable time living, traveling, speaking, and working with indigenous communities internationally and across Canada, and considers herself a nomad, just like her ancestors. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, and take it away, folks. Thanks so much, Roberto. It's a pleasure to be here um, with you all today. Um, and thank you for bearing with us as we navigate uh, life in Zoom land. Um, we've had some fun this afternoon already navigating technology, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have uh, a nice chat together today. We were so, we sort of talked about this session as being a fireside chat, and I'm actually beside an empty fireplace, so I feel like we're almost there. Um, but it's a delight to have both um, Marie and Tanchai with me today for this really important conversation um, to people who I respect immensely, whose work has been transformative in terms of supporting the life and well-being and health of queer, trans, and two-spirit young people across Turtle Island and, uh, and to people I consider friends as well. So it's nice to have you both here today. And we're just going to talk through some of the key issues that, um, you know, that shape our work. And, yeah, I guess one of the things I wanted to start off by talking about today was really what what aspects of working with queer, trans, and two-spirit young people really call out to you or that really matters to you. Why do you do the work that you do? I just thought that might be a nice place for us to start. So why don't we start with Marie? What are your thoughts? Thanks, Jeff. Um, that's a really um, meaningful question for me. One of the one of the things that uh, really calls me to uh, the types of work that I do um, with other two spirit queer and trans young indigenous folks um, is um, kind of creating spaces where we can be together and um, near full selves. Um, so a lot of times um, because of you know, racism, colonialism, transphobia, homophobia, biphobia, um, all those isms. Um, 
there aren't a lot of um, spaces um, where young indigenous um, folks who you know have um, complex genders or um, sexualities outside of heterosexuality can um, come together and really bring our indigeneity and our um, and our sexualities and genders um, and kind of be all of ourselves. Um, and so creating those spaces where we can uh, connect and where we can you know build our own communities and build our own networks where we do the work that we need to do for ourselves and for our communities is is really important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so building spaces that welcome people in that um, allow people to be that nourish really the space for people to be them their full selves um, in, in all ways and all complexity. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Marie. Tanta, what do you think? Similar? Yeah, for me, this, this work is so deeply personal. Um, having grown up a young Indigenous queer person um, and still being a young Indigenous queer person today, and uh, growing up as a young Indigenous queer person, um, those different parts of my identities have been a long journey, so to speak, mm -hmm. in understanding um, and and really coming into myself and you know what holding these identities mean for me. It was never just you know I'm a like <laughs> at a young age it was never I'm 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 queer I'm Indigenous and I'm proud. Mm -hmm. it, that's not how it started. Um, as I'm sure it is for a lot of queer Indigenous folks. And I really had to grow into those identities. So for me, this work is deeply personal in the sense of, you know, I was a young Indigenous person who carried a lot of intergenerational trauma and who was closeted for many years. And um, I do this work because I know what it's like. I know what it's like to feel alone in my body, to feel alone in a, a very populated and busy world. And so I do this work in order for other young Indigenous queer folks to know that they are not alone um, in whatever it is that they are questioning or experiencing. And so I think the work that I do is really a call out um, or a hand reaching out to those young folks to say, you know what, I'm here with you we're all here with you. Mm -hmm. um, we can walk this journey or walk this path together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful and profound. Um, yeah, I, I, it's it's funny, the title of this talk, I'm talking with Indigenous youth leaders, I laugh because I don't feel like a youth anymore, but I don't feel like it was that long ago either. Um, and I know each of you now work, when I, when I met you, very much were like identified in public spaces as youth, Indigenous youth leaders, but I now know very much are in roles of mentoring youth. And, and so there's this constant movement between our like roles as young people and as um, leaders in our community and also mentors and aunties and uncles and, and, and caregivers in a variety of, of ways. Um, and I just really appreciate the way you both bring it back to like our own stories and our own lived experiences of, of what it means to navigate journeys of understanding oneself and and understanding relationships to communities. And I think, you know, my own learning, I think I'm still even, you know, at this stage of my life, navigating this relationship to this, this legacy and these movements of two-spirit people. Um, I think it hasn't always been like a direct, like, yes, I am two-spirit or um, like positioning myself in relationship to, to that history has been a journey uh, for me. And so I guess I'm wondering in what ways your work if you were to sort of trace that, what ways your work connects to two-spirit people and movements and story? Um, how would you, like, did that question make sense? <laughs> I know, Marie, you've written about this um, in, your, in your graduate research and, and your forthcoming book, which is going to be amazing. Um, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, big question, big question. <laughs> um, well, I think that, I mean, maybe this is like a stereotypical indigenous person thing to say, but like I think about my ancestors a lot um, and um, including like, uh, like queer, trans, two-spirit um, folks, like ancestors, like ancestors near and far. So like long, 
folks who lived a long time ago and folks who um, folks who uh, lived only a short time ago, and of course our elders, grandparents, aunties and uncles, and and envies of all genders who are with us now. Um, and I think that you know, in my um, in my research, like I uh, my my research uh, for my master's degree at Boise um, was very much centered around um, how young Indigenous, queer, trans, and two spirit folks in Toronto. Um, have relationships to the term two spirit, and a lot of that, a lot of those conversations did um, kind of go back to um, uh, you know the the kind of um, organizing and activism that um, was happening around the the eighties and early nineties, and of course that is still going on today, um, and that indeed was going on for for many generations even before the eighties and nineties, but specifically around that time period when the term two spirit um, kind of came into the English language. Um, and I think that one way that the, that, that history, um, you know, and the, the histories that, and the kind of legacies that our ancestors and, and grandparents um, and previous generations of queer indigenous activists have left us um, are really um, something that a lot of uh, young, queer, trans and two-spirit indigenous folks that I'm in a relationship with really want to talk about and really want to have um, those like really get into those those really deep and rich conversations. Um, particularly around um, oftentimes like what, um, what, what this history means for us moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of, um, for me, it's kind of always those two, those two sides and then us kind of in the middle in the present. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I really don't know if that answered the question. No, that was, I mean, what do you, would I, did that spark thoughts for you too, Chan Chai? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, the outgrowing of the youth, because <laughs> I'm definitely still, I'm, I'm still considered a youth and definitely feel like I'm, I'm aging that as well. I'm, I've transitioned to the, the auntie uncle role um, and that mentorship role. Um, with a lot of the the young folks that I've spent time with. Um, yeah, I guess my legacy, so to speak, was co-founding We Matter, uh, which was briefly mentioned. And We Matter is a national Indigenous youth-led movement dedicated to creating spaces of support, hope, and healing for Indigenous young people, um, you know, of all genders, sexualities, First Nation, Inuit, Métis, like a whole diversity of Indigenous young folks. And that came out of, you know, the direct experience that I shared around that feeling of aloneness that I think a lot of young Indigenous and especially young 2S LGBTQ Indigenous people experience. And so what We Matter was all about, and I'm not working uh, with We Matter in a day-to-day -day capacity anymore. I've, I've passed on the baton. Um, but my years of working with We Matter was really um, like Marie was saying, creating these spaces for Indigenous young folks, um, diverse Indigenous young folks to come together and share and unpack histories, um, learn from each other, build connections, build community. And those spaces are so incredibly important um, because they're not always easy to access. And uh, we've been able to do that with We Matter in a unique way in that we've created kind of this virtual or national platform mm -hmm. where young people, no matter where they are in the country, are able to connect and find stories um, of other Indigenous folks or role models or mentors who may have been through similar experiences. They're able to connect with those narratives and connect with those stories in a way that is um, from that place of strength and hope and healing. Um, compared to, or I guess as opposed to, you know, really focusing on the challenges, the adversity, the issues that a lot of folks experience. Um, we work a lot in kind of reframing conversations around identity um, so that they do feel hopeful and strength-based. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like what you're saying at the, I mean, all of it was great. I, I love We Matter. If you don't know about We Matter, learn everything you can. Yeah, we <laughs> but what you're just saying about the end about like reframing, like um, I know that each of us in, in various contexts before have had a conversation around sort of the trouble or the problem of description and how 
um, we so frequently um, get asked to define or to, I know actually, I think Jesse, Jody, and Rocky were even talking about this, like in the previous session about being asked really um, damage oriented questions um, and sort of um, trying to describe, trying to make legible for everybody but indigenous people, indigenous people's experience and how, how difficult that can be. Um, and I guess, you know, you've already started speaking a little bit, Tanchai, to the types of, you know, frames of reference that we want to be having, but I guess I'm curious to hear maybe a little more from you and then and Marie about, you know, the that sort of tension between the types of conversations people keep asking us to have versus the conversations that um, two-spirit, queer, and trans young people not only want to have, but are already having. Um, what do you think? Yeah. Um, for the past five years, uh, I have been on a lot of panels um, and done a lot of presentations and been on a lot of roundtables and tables and you know government tables and mental health tables and I've been I've been in in, in these spaces um, for many years and I have to say that the conversations that are happening at many different levels are not varied. Um, Oftentimes, it's the exact same conversations that are happening over and over again um, in regard specifically um, the work I do, Indigenous youth mental health and uh, 2S LGBTQ plus mental health. And um, a lot of the time, the framing of these conversations are, you know, what are the challenges? What are the issues? Um, what is impacting, um, you know, Indigenous young people, queer uh, trans indigenous young people it's 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 deficit focused and those conversations are really exhausting because you know we as queer um, indigenous young people we know what issues are we we walk through this world day to day experiencing these things over and over and over again and that's not what we want to be talking about we want to be talking about um, you know how do things change how do we you know, how can we walk through this world so that we aren't experiencing those same things over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. And those are the conversations that I'm interested in having. And those are the conversations that I want Indigenous, um, queer Indigenous young people to be having um, because it opens, it's like, you know, cracking windows and opening doors um, that just feel so shut a lot of the time. And I, I, I want, spaces where we can think critically and openly about like envisioning beyond the reality that's in front of us. Mm -hmm. And I think those conversations aren't had enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think, Marie? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for all of that, Tanchai. I mean, what kind of comes to mind for me is a phrase that has been um, kind of circulated a lot the past year of like this idea that we keep each other safe um, and kind of um, whether that's around like abolishing the police, um, all, all of these conversations that have kind of come to the fore um, over the past, you know, what feels like the decade that has been 2020 so far, um, still eight weeks ago. But um, I think that one of the things that um, is uh, important to kind of understand in terms of um, in terms of the conversations that we uh, want to be having as um, two spirit queer and trans indigenous young people um, is that you know a lot of a lot of the time you know we are the folks um, who are you know already um, providing uh, you know the kinds of support and um, and kind of, yeah, I guess all kinds of support to one another. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm thinking about something that a, a really dear friend and colleague, one of my colleagues at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network um, often says is that, um, you know, like uh, it's not that, um, kind of as Tunch I was saying, it's not that, uh, it's not that like, we need to know more about the issues or challenges. It's not. A, it's not actually even like, um, like Indigenous Services Canada or like 
any any kind of healthcare provider actually, I think that like, you know, a knowledge of the issues and challenges for them is key, but also it's not like we need to be telling them more about, um, about the issues so that they can provide um, the kind of health services that we want to see. It's that folks need to be resourcing our communities for what we are already doing for one another on an everyday basis. Mm -hmm. Like it's truly like we, like we do crisis intervention for one another. We um, provide support to one another. It's like mutual aid has a, has a really long and really beautiful history in indigenous communities and queer and trans indigenous communities are no exception to that. And so I think that, you know, that's a piece of the conversation um, that also kind of informs the piece around, you know, what are the, what are the conversations that we're already having and that we want to, um, you know, be resourced to have have more time to have um, this kind of thing. Because oftentimes, because our communities are, you know, purposefully kept in crisis by settler colonialism, um, you know, the conversations that we um, want to be having and are having around things like um, access to ceremony and culture, things about you know our languages and um, revitalizing them and keeping them around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like learning the things that we need to learn in order to, you know, exist as, um, as our full selves, Mm -hmm. um, in order to, um, have those, uh, conversations, we also kind of, um, it would, it would be helpful. I mean, we're already having those conversations alongside all of the other things we're doing, but it would be helpful, um, you know, to, to be, uh, to have our communities resourced in a way that, um, that allows us to, um, you know, do the 8 million jobs we're doing <laughs> with, with, yeah. with some external support um, as well. So there's there's always that tension of kind of, you know, like there's there's the piece that we do need to talk um, about the, about the, all of the, all of the colonialism pieces. And then also, you know, we're always already, um, already kind of light years ahead of that in, in terms of our own conversations and how we're managing it and um, how we're thriving despite all of it, right? So there's that mm-hmm. that tension all the time. So, I mean, I really appreciate what you're saying, Marie, um, because I, you know, it's some of my own work. I mean, I want to give a shout out to um, young leaders really that are here in the conference even, um, but I'm thinking about folks from YouthCo and the Yosnawas program, which I get a lot of opportunities to work with directly you know, the philosophy of this program is young people taking care of each other. And I think um, a lot about how powerful that is and how um, sometimes it's like formal systems can get in the way um, by trying to, you know, how trying to sort of connect to and um, make sense of their lived experiences when really what you're talking about, Marie, is about people with power actively, um, in you know, de- decentering themselves and reallocating the resources, whether that's material or otherwise, towards really seeing young people lead the types of change processes that they want, especially in the context of two spirit um, community. Um, I guess so. As like a, as a researcher and as a psychologist who works a lot with two spirit people. You know, I think a lot about this when people hear a conversation like the one we're just having right now, people say, you know, they think, oh, what we need to do is strengths based work that like, you know, we don't ever talk about damage. We don't ever talk about deficits. It's almost like we can only talk about the good stuff, but we will fail. I've seen it sometimes happen where health researchers, especially almost like fail to talk about some of the sources of distress. And, you know, Marie, you, you explicitly named colonialism, you named racialized policing. Um, but I guess one of the questions I have would be about like, how do we have conversations about, um, you know, real threats to well-being for our communities, um, while at the same time anchoring that within the vitality of our, and the strength of our communities. So that sort of tension, and you've both been speaking to that, but I, you know, when we spoke previously, we were sort of talking a little bit about more holistic ways of speaking. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on that, Tamjai. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of things coming to, to my mind. Um, so I'm going to try to kind of sift through it all um, and formulate kind of uh, an answer. 
Um, yeah, I mean, listen, like talking about, um, it's not it's not one or the other, and it's it's never black and white. And I think, yeah, it's it's never black and white. You you can't. You can't always just talk about the good stuff and you can't always just talk about um, the challenges and, and the bad stuff because um, a lot is missed um, in that conversation. And I so um, and this is a big part of, of the work that I've done over the years is how to how to have these conversations in a way where there is space to be able to acknowledge and point to and name like the hurt and the trauma and you know the ongoing um, challenges that young two spirit folks face. Um, there needs to be space for that. Um, but I think there's a difference in in holding that space in a good or an intentional and a thoughtful way. You know, so many times um, I've seen this where you know a young two spirit person gets invited to a table and is often, you know, the only two-spirit person or the only Indigenous person at the table. And, you know, they're called to to speak to, to deeply personal things in environments that don't always feel safe um, or where, you know, it feels very one-sided as opposed to a reciprocal relationship or a reciprocal conversation of we're sitting here, I value you in this circle, I value your voice and the experiences that you bring, and I'm going to hold that with great care and attention. That's what I don't see. And so I think we need to be thinking about how we can hold these very intentional, meaningful spaces so that folks feel comfortable to, to unpack a lot of this heavy stuff Mm -hmm. but also in ways that that feel um, forward moving. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think of it as kind of like a loop cycle. And I think it's so common to get stuck in this loop cycle of like, but and this is and this is the like rather than acknowledging naming and then and then and then shifting. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think shifting from what's wrong to, you know, how do we change this? Um, that often also feels very one-sided. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to use an example that actually connects perfectly to what Marie was saying, is many times there have been non-Indigenous organizations reach out to um, Indigenous organizations saying, we're developing this resource or we're creating this resource and we want your feedback. How do we create this resource in a good way? And similar to what Marie was saying, it's like, well, we're already doing this work. Two-spirit like communities and Indigenous communities are already doing this work. Um, and by taking time to support you, to give you feedback and insight on how to create this resource that is, you know, acceptable for use with Indigenous communities, um, like, how about we have the resources um, to be able to develop our own resources? And so, oftentimes, I feel like my time has been torn to educate um, and kind of unpack my own traumas and histories for other people rather than spending time with my own community. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten to a point where I've had to be very selective in choosing the spaces that I want to enter in. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that would be different if those spaces, again, were a lot more intentional um, in, in having conversations. And I think for folks hosting those conversations, it's asking you know, yourself, why am I inviting this person here today? Mm -hmm. Why am I inviting this two-spirit young person to this circle? What is my intent with that? And I don't think folks ask themselves that question enough in these particular spaces. Yeah, the, the whole like um, death by consultation is like a, a very, pervasive practice that I think actually it's really good for us in a context of a conference like this to really pause and think about like you know in our attempts to be community engaged in research to really make sure that everybody is at the table um, it's it's also equally important not to treat um, two-spirit people as sort of um, token stakeholders and not actually substantively involved in the leadership um, and design and um, 
you know, the, the, at the center of the care practices that we're envisioning. And I mean, I, I mean, the types of care practices to spirit young people are envisioning are, are effective. They're beautiful. They're transformative. You know, some of the work that we're doing in, in my um, research at the moment is really focusing on the ways that young people are, you know, lifting up mental health practices, suicide prevention practices, cultural renewal and language reawakening practices, sexual health practices. Um, you know, these are these are the things that so many organizations are trying to somehow do. But if there was, in, in a sense, a greater um, material resourcing of, of two-spirit young people and two-spirit communities, that work could flourish more fully without replication, without um, extraction, which is, I know, another concern that you hold, Marie. And I wonder, if, before we sort of pivot to taking questions soon, do you have any further thoughts on that dynamic? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, in a research context, the ways that um, the ways that that over consultation plays out are, are often really specific and happen. Uh, like I've seen them happen even like with <laughs> with two very young people here in Toronto, the amount of consultations and like the amount even for like one city, one group of people in one city. Um, the like amount of consultations versus the amount of investment in our communities. It's a stark difference. Um, and part of that is the way that, you know, the, the, the research uh, mechanism apparatus kind of, kind of keeps rolling, rolling on. It's kind of steamrolling everything in its path sometimes. Um, but that's, I find that that's often, um, what like a bit of the, the crux of it is around mm -hmm. you know there's always there's always research dollars and there's always some some either like indigenous faculty and university and you know like allies at city hall always ways to get that research money and there's there's very very infrequently the, um the actual material resources to follow up on any of those mm -hmm. you know, recommendations and um and things like that and it's not uh, i mean like research is research in indigenous communities is a whole a whole other conversation that we um can have but um so it's it's a it's a problem in research and as we see with um pretty much every consultation that any government body in this country has ever mm -hmm. done with indigenous people it's a strategy um you know of continued oppression as well like we mm -hmm. have the <laughs> we see it we've seen it with um the MMIW um, final report. We've seen it with the TRC. We saw it with RCAP in the '90s. It keeps it keeps happening, and that's for a reason. And so I think that um, you know, no recognizing that pattern mm -hmm. is part of um, is part of the key to uh, dismantling yeah. it and interrupting it. Maria and I really appreciate your thoughts on that. I think it's a very like bold caution to the CBRC summit to really reiterate. Um, that we could find ourselves complicit in the very practices that oppress people in our desires to support the spirit communities. And so that that really being careful and thoughtful about how we do that work is is such an important thing. I have two questions I want to ask before we put it to the audience. One, I think, given the theme of this conference on resistance, um, I wanted to ask this question about the types of narratives of sexuality and gender that are prominent or that shape the lived experiences of two-spirit, queer, and trans, indigenous young people, and what ways that these communities, our communities, are resisting and refusing these ways of being framed. Um, Tanshai, what do you think? Yeah, I love, this is, this is what I want to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, so many harmful narratives when it comes to, um, I guess, queerness, um, and again, I'm, when I'm speaking from my own kind of personal um, experiences and, and voice here, but, you know, sexuality, it's the, the taboo that exists a, in a lot of Indigenous communities still, but also kind of broadly across society, um, is that, you know, sex is dirty and, um, like something that that shouldn't be talked about, and you know we're putting ideas in in like young people's heads, and and it it really creates 
this, um, but also you think of you know missing and murdered indigenous women, the like hypersexualization or um, the over sexualization of kind of indigenous women and girls in very kind of stereotypical and harmful ways. Um, you know, there's a lot of violence against black and brown bodies, indigenous bodies, queer and trans bodies. And so the, the narratives that exist for two spirit people are, you know, um, the violence that is constantly inflicted upon community, um, the, the dirtiness, so to speak, of engaging in like sexuality and sexual acts, which goes back to, you know, colonization and that, that period of residential schools, you know, where nuns and priests, um, you know, were very firm in, in making sure that binary existed. Um, and, and that's so deep rooted after, after decades of colonization in, in indigenous communities um, that homophobia, the fear, the transphobia, the it's been so deeply rooted and you can't talk about these narratives without talking about that pro the process of colonization, the very strategic systemic process of colonization and, and assimilation. And so um, in my work uh, and also personally in my creative work that I do, um, it's shaking up those narratives. And I think so many Two-Spirit folks are at the forefront of this movement of, um, you know, saying, I'm not gonna be ashamed of my identity anymore. I'm not gonna be ashamed of my body as an indigenous woman, as an indigenous trans person, as an indigenous queer person. And so I see these narratives being, being shaken up in different ways by these young folks through through art, mostly through art and creative means, through burlesque um, and drag performance, through um, beading and makeup. And you know, if you go on TikTok, the indigenous community on TikTok is massive. And it's just people making these like incredible bold statements about you know refusal to be silent and I'm not going to be defined by these narratives anymore. Um, you know, I'm allowed to be uh, an indigenous woman and be and feel sexual and feel sensual and be proud of that. Um, and I could I could just go on and on about the the different examples of folks resisting those narratives. Mm -hmm. But I think um, like I would love to I would love more spaces where queer and trans indigenous folks could feel comfortable um, talking about, you know, their bodies and sexuality and gender in ways that feel, you know, empowering, that feel powerful, that feel um, good because the narratives out there, um, you know, they, they go against that. And it, it means that a lot of young indigenous and a lot of queer indigenous folks are, are growing up thinking that, you know, who I am is wrong. Um, and maybe who I want to be is wrong. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's harmful, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about like pretty profound decolonizing work that, that goes further than just saying like, we're against stigma. It's like unsettling the foundations of shame, unsettling the foundations of how black and brown bodies, how trans bodies, how two-spirit and queer bodies have been marked for a type of erasure. Um, I, I just, I so appreciate that, Tanchai. Marie, do you have any thoughts on this question? Absolutely. Um, and I think that the, the piece I want to touch on really briefly is around um, the around that that idea of of feeling good and that um and pleasure as something that is that 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 is resistance and is you know a form of um of resistance to colonialism and and all of all of the um yeah all of this the stereotypes and nar narratives that um cause harm to our communities um and um you know i see um, a lot of um, artists, um, definitely on TikTok, like every, everything that you were saying, Tanchai, um, folks, like even, um, and I, I see a lot of this kind of theorizing also happening in, in our communities, like um, 
folks are talking about how like um, posting a thirst trap on Instagram is a form of decolonization because you're 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 speaking back to that um, to that shame and that stigma. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, in my work at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, um, you know, we're a grassroots organization, intergenerational, um, that's focused on sexual health and reproductive justice, um, indigenous communities um, all over the place um, on Turtle Island. Um, but, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of what it comes down to is um, kind of is, is that, um, that pleasure and, and feeling good element. And then I think um, it's something that, you know, I've, I've been thinking about a lot kind of in 2020 and thinking about how um, pleasure and rest, um, you know, are really uh, important parts of, um, of, of the work that you know, we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to take some time to ask questions of those who've been participating in this session. Before I do, I'm gonna ask you a question which I'm gonna let percolate. And we'll close out with your final remarks on it. But you know, you know that the work that all three of us have been involved with in some ways addressing the issue of suicide among two spirit, queer, and trans young people. Um, and my dear friend and colleague Jennifer White often says, like, we need to shift towards the question away from preventing death towards asking ourselves, how do we envision worlds worth living in? Um, and so I think about that a lot in my work with two spirit community, um, like the type of worlds that we are building, the types of ways we are imagining ourselves into a future. Um, and so I wanna ask you to think about that as we take these questions from the audience and then um, we'll finish up with your responses to that question. Um, so yeah, if, thank you for joining with us. And if you have some questions that you would like to ask um, that are appropriate, I'd like to first open the floor to any um, two-spirit um, folks in this space um, and if you're an Indigenous trans or queer young person, we would love to hear your questions or comments first. Um, and then if there are no questions, we'll go to the general audience after that. And I believe my dear friends who are behind the technical scenes are going to show me the questions or any. Um, but we'll wait, maybe there are no questions. We'll see. Um, okay. I don't know. I actually can't see questions on here. I'm posted into the private chat, so I'm not sure if I'm missing questions from the audience. But if I am, there's enough people here who should text me and tell me. Um, otherwise, I'll just like ask more of my questions, which I have many. <laughs> Um, it looks like there haven't been any specific questions. Um, so let's do that instead. Um, so one question I have that I, you know, I didn't ask, but I will ask about explicitly. Um, oh, we did get one question um, from some folks at YouthCo. Um, and that is, where do you find the most joy in the work that you do? Like, what is it that, where, where and what is the thing that brings you the most joy in your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this work is hard and it's exhausting. And, um, you know, there are days where it feels like you're pushing multiple boulders uphill. Um, but I think the, the, the small wins or those moments of joy for me are seeing the like um, aha moment, so to speak, in the young folks that I have been honored to work with is you know, there's there's usually this moment for me where it clicks and they're like, whoa, I'm not I'm not the only one who's who's gone through this. Um, and it, it's so clear um, when that moment clicks and you see it um, in their face or in the questions that they're asking and I always think back to this one particular moment that st has stuck with me years later. And I was working in Northern Saskatchewan in one of the communities that had just a few months prior had a suicide crisis. And uh, 
very, very young girls had died by suicide. And I was sitting down with this young woman and I remember playing one of the We Matter videos, which was uh, Don Bernstick, actually, who's a comedian. And he was talking about his experience, um, you know, having attempted suicide and how he, how he overcame that. And I sat down with her and we we're watching this video together. And I remember this moment where the video ended and she turned to me and she knew Don Bernstick because Don Bernstick had been to her community doing shows. And it was like, wow, like he he's had experiences with suicide. And I was like, yeah. Um, and it was this moment of 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 truly believing that, you know, that she wasn't the only one. Mm -hmm. And in that moment knew that there were other indigenous, you know, role models and mentors um, that she could look to and see herself in. And so there are moments, um, many numerous moments like that, where um, the young folks that I've worked with feel a sense of connection to someone else or the sense of belonging. Um, and it's like their circle has expanded in a way. And I think it's so beautiful. And those are the moments that I live for uh, of like, yeah, you're, you're not, you're not alone. Um, you know, I'm here. And even if I never see you again, um, we've had this moment and know that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of you always. Um, and I think those just those moments of, of being seen um, are so beautiful and so powerful. I put myself on mute because my puppy started making noise, but um, that is a beautiful moment. I relate to that, especially as a therapist talking to young people and those moments when you can like join someone's experience and be community, hold up community in a moment. It's, it's powerful. And to, and to normalize, to connect people to a, a shared experience. It's, it's a, it's an incredible feeling. Marie, what about you? Where, where is the joy? Um, I would say kind of similarly in, in those, uh, you know, moments of connection when, um, uh, oftentimes with, uh, the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, um, will, uh, do, uh, workshops around, you know, two-spirit, um, identity, um, supporting queer and trans young people, um, uh, and a lot of the time, um, folks, there's oftentimes there's there's folks who are two spirit and there's oftentimes folks who are not two spirit in those spaces. And one of my favorite things is um, is having like a, a dada or like a, a grandparent in the space who like will tell you about their um, their their grandchild who uh, you know like it like and they'll they'll use they'll use language the, the language that they have to describe like their grand grandchild who's you know non-binary or two-spirit or is gay or or any number of things um but just being able to see the like like pure love in in mm -hmm. parents faces when they're when they're and they're out searching for 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 language and for resources and for things to support their grandchild even when they don't know you know the like right words to use or the words that um that they're grandchild would want to um uh you know you know teach them but maybe hasn't had the chance to yet but just seeing that and being able to you know kind of um equip folks with the tools um, mm -hmm. to support their loved ones um mm -hmm. is really meaningful for me mm -hmm. Um, we actually have quite a few questions coming through now, so I'm going to try and synthesize a few. There's been a number of questions which have been about people in later in their life, not necessarily as youth or young people, but later in their life coming to knowledge of Two-Spirit teachings and community. Um, and um, another person, um, a therapist, was asking some questions about working with a client who may have um, not like a direct knowledge of two-spirit cultural community roles and responsibilities. So I guess I'm wondering if either of you um, have some thoughts about like, you know, that experience. And I know that's not very clear. It's a synthesis of questions, but like this sort of, there isn't really a lot of resources, I think, for people who are like coming to awareness of two-spirit life and community at points beyond like 
being embedded within a community. And so I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Do you want to start? <laughs> It's a tough question, but I'm I I'll I'll dive in. I'm down to dive in. Um, yeah. I mean, I it it is it's hard. Um, I think that that's one piece of of, of the answer that it's um, hard. I think that one thing that has grown in the last few years um, is um, online spaces to connect with. Um, other two spirit folks. So I think that that's uh, an important piece. Um, and you know, there's uh, kind of that there's the annual two spirit gathering um, that you know went virtual this year because of the pandemic. Um, and in, in, I think in terms of in terms of um, pieces around um, culture, I think that that's um, I think that's oftentimes tougher to access for many reasons um, and tougher to find in, in virtual spaces as well, thinking about our current situation. Um, but um, I mean, not to like toot my own horn, but I wrote a small zine based on the, uh, the research kind of that I did in my master's and um, and so I think, and there are other kind of, you know, like those pockets of resources kind of out there online mm -hmm. um, that um, that can be found. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Um, I was just going to build off that. I was, I was going to mention your your the, the thing that you created because um, it's great. But yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. But there are usually two spirit societies or groups. Um, in various cities, um, like I know the Edmonton Two Spirit Society is a very like active one. Um, so it depends on where you're located. Just um, you know, seeking out those local groups. Um, but there are there are materials out there, and I guess I would say, you know, look for content by Two Spirit individuals because there there are beautiful books. Um, be it, you know, fiction or nonfiction, memoirs, um, poetry, podcasts, music. Um, there are two spirit creators who are very active and they're out there creating. Um, and I can name like, you know, a number off my head from Jeremy Dutcher to Shawnee um, to Isque. Like there are incredible two spirit artists out there. And I think connecting folks to, to this community even if it's not a small kind of tight knit community that I can go and hang out with, um, I think of community at a larger scale that, you know, mm -hmm. just by connecting with two spirit musicians and uh, books. And mm -hmm. like, I know of an indigenous queer series that's gonna be coming out soon, um, that there are different avenues of building community um, beyond like a group. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's always a good first step is, you know, if you're non-Indigenous or if you are Indigenous, curating your own list of incredible like two-spirit creators um, that you can dive into or connect other people to. Um, and then I will toot my own horn and say that We Matter um, actually had launched a two-spirit dictionary in the springtime. And the two-spirit dictionary was a national campaign um, meant to share definitions of what it means to be two-spirit by two-spirit people uh, mm -hmm. submitting. And so if you go on the We Matter website at wemattercampaign.org, there's actually a two-spirit dictionary page of various two-spirit identified folks offering, um, you know, for them what it means to be two-spirit. And the hope is uh, for We Matter to actually create a physical dictionary, um, like a resource that can then be circulated um, around to communities. Yeah, it, that's just a beautiful, I think, invitation that, and a generous invitation that you both have offered to to come closer to community. And I think one one thing I would say to, especially those people here who are not Indigenous, is to always critically reflect on the reality of that question. That like cultural and community alienation is not you know inconsequential. It's a product of a particular history of colonial interference in communities. 
Um, and so I have a lot of like love for the people that are like working at rethreading their lives to community. And I would just say encouragement that there's a well-worn path of many people who have traveled that journey um, and beginning with their words, beginning with their music, beginning with their writing is a really wonderful thing. And I know both Tancha and Marie have uh, books, um, zines, books, poetry, incredible scholarship. Um, Marie has an amazing book coming out next year that's going to be one of the most seminal works on two-spirit, um, queer, and trans, indigenous young people in the world. And, and you know, it's just amazing scholarship that you both have done. And um, I just, yeah, I appreciate that invitation towards that, that, that archive of material. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, there's a few other questions here, two that really stood out to me. One is, uh, I'll just say them both and you can respond, maybe one of you can respond to each of them. One of them is about how do we think we could go about supporting queer indigenous solidarity or relationality transnationally? I wanna connect to gender fluid, indigenous families and friends in the Philippines, but a lot of these conversations in and of themselves are colonial. Do you have any suggestions for providing support rather than restarting conversations that people may already be having? So that's one question. And the other question was, um, um, what strategies um, would you speak to for holding institutions accountable to your consultation? Um, so two, pick one and run with it. <laughs> They're both big questions. <laughs> um, ooh, yeah, so transnational connection. Um, the first one, can you repeat the, the kind of intent of the other question? So being able to yeah. connect gender diverse folks. Across the world and especially oh. indigenous, indigenous gender fluid, um, gender diverse folks across, across borders. Um, what, what, uh, what do you think, do you have any thoughts on how to, how to engage those conversations? Mm. That's a really interesting question. Um, one that I, I don't really have an answer to, but I, I love that question. And I think I think the 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 larger, the the bigger a community gets, um, the more I guess the 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 easier it gets to navigate the world, very kind of generally speaking. Um, so I think it's a beautiful idea for indigenous you know, gender and sexually diverse folks internationally to be able to connect and have those conversations. And I think in my experience working internationally um, and touching on just, you know, stuff I've already said before is that um, connection, realizing that histories, um, and especially colonial histories in countries around the world, although very different, are also very similar. Mm -hmm. And the impacts of colonization in various countries around the world are very similar. And so I think that is a connection point or a starting point in being able to have these conversations is, you know, understanding, you know, what are what are some of the differences in the impacts of colonization that we're seeing, but also what are what are those similarities and maybe what are the resources that we all have where we are um, to, you know, team up and create a global movement or how can we cross share resources and mm -hmm. um, knowledge share with each other mm -hmm. um, is so i'm not really providing an answer to the question but no, I, no, it's it's, but it's it's good it, yeah I think, I, I think it's just you know there are spaces needed and i think um you know uh organizations funders agencies need to be willing to put, you know, the money and resources to being able to create these spaces. Yeah. Um, in, you know, the, the name of allyship, it's, you know, what can I offer to you? What can I offer um, so that, you know, you have what you need um, for your community to be able to do that work? Again, like Marie was saying um, before, that we're already supporting each other. So. Um, yeah, I think it comes down to um, seeing it as, uh, you know, it being beneficial to to put resources to be able to create these spaces. I'm aware that we are out of time, and I, I that's I feel like I want to talk about consultation. I want to talk about like systems change, all that with you. So we'll have to like write a paper or something, or do another fireside chat somewhere. 
But before I leave, I want to just maybe ask one, like, come back to that question about worlds worth living in. And I've been like, I know my answer, but if you have a sentence, an idea about that question, what would it be? Oh, in one sentence. <laughs> um, I envision a world where trans and two-spirit indigenous young people, um, where anything is possible for us, um, where we can see ourselves as actors and doctors and creators and lawyers and I know that that is a possibility. Um, and I would also, I envision a world of joy and belonging where Two-Spirit and trans young people get to move through their days experiencing more joy than hurt. And I don't think that's a case um, for a lot of folks. And I would like to, I would like to see that joy outweigh um, the everyday harms. Mm. Yes, I'm with you on that vision. Marie, what do you think? I love all of that. Um, yeah, I think that like when I, when I think about this, um, it's um, a world where we are, have, all of us get to have that sense of belonging as indigenous folks. Um, where we're all well rested mm -hmm. and where we have the land back. Yeah. For me, I would say the answer to that question is where there's more space for people like you two to do what you're doing today. Um, you know, living in your gifts, expressing the tremendous diversity of talent and brilliance that you each hold. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I want young people to see themselves in you too. I want them to see themselves in your courage and your, your strength and your humility and, and your generosity. So thank you so much for your good medicine sharing with us today. I will hold it like a treasure. And um, thank you to the CBRC Summit for having this conversation. It's been deeply meaningful to me. Um, and I will pass it back. And, and mercy show to Jeffrey yeah. for moder facilitating this conversation. Yeah, maybe <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I'll pass it back to Michael Quigg. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Jeffrey, and, and thank you, Marie and Tanjai. That was um, an, a, a really amazing and important conversation. Um, I know that we're a bit over time. I had some sort of closing remarks because I was listening intently throughout. And uh, I think just for me, like just a real takeaway has been to unpack the importance uh, and the value of centering to spirit and, indi and indigenous youth not only as participants, but, you know, leaders in these kinds of conversations. And, um, you know, I think on the one hand, um, I was sort of struck on how much more work there still is to do around decolonizing and, dis and destigmatizing our language and our framing and our spaces to make them more empowering and asset-based. But the other thing, you know, and this is sort of like in line with trying to be more asset-based is just thinking about how this conversation has really been inspiring and encouraging, thinking about the potential, the potential and uh, the impact of, you know, when we better listen to and center and support two-spirit youth leadership um, in resisting and challenging the uh, the dominant narratives that are contributing to so much stigma and shame. Um, so big thanks to all of you for sharing your insights, experience, and perspectives with us for uh, this really special conversation. Um, just before we close uh, today's event, um, I just want to make a quick plug uh, for everyone uh, to just complete the super quick poll in the chat uh, to let us know what you thought about uh, today's session. And uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to today's opening plenaries. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for day two of the summit. Thanks. <laughs>